coming up with special guests, UFC lightweight Josh Thompson and UFC welterweight Matt Brown. But first, let's take a minute and talk about some of the news that we've seen going on here in the UFC as of late. We have the UFC 158 drug test results back from the March 16th card in Montreal. Six fighters were tested. The names weren't released. There is some speculation going on that possibly and possibly not Nick Diaz was tested. Guys, what are your thoughts on all these guys that tested and came back clean? Well, here's the funny thing about this. Um, no names were released, but Nick Diaz is, you know, a representative of Nick Diaz says that he was, in fact, one of the guys tested and his results came back negative. Well, now... I don't know if this is because it's Nick Diaz and whenever wherever Nick Diaz goes, drama follows. But he is now requesting a copy of the results that uh, and a exact list of what was tested. W like this is what's funny, okay? Uh, and Ryan, I know we were talking about this a little bit ago, and you know I was playing all conspiracy theory. Wait, dude, maybe Nick <laughs> took a banned substance just to see if he'd get caught. But it, the reality of the situation is is Nick Diaz probably didn't stop what he was doing when he was supposed to do it and probably thought he was going to pop hot for pot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, he didn't. Yeah, well, he did say that in the post-fight press conference. He's like, I'm probably in a test positive for this. Oh, and boom, I haven't paid my taxes. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and here's the thing I don't understand. It's like you go into Quebec, you go into, a, you go into like, this foreign land. You, 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 it's... It, 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 and, and you and you come out the other end perfectly unscathed. Why are you going back to this? Yeah, what, leave it alone. You, yeah, Nick, 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 buddy, y you passed. You <laughs> go home. Yeah, just exactly. And especially you know the situations that happened on the way home. Yeah, I mean, dude, on the way home, he landed in the airport, and on the way from that highway, <laughs> Heidi, you know it well because you've yeah. been at that oh, airport. Yeah. That highway, that stretch leads right back down to his house. He got pulled over. And those are some tricky roads down there. Yeah. You know, from firsthand experience driving down there, they're mostly just one way one side, one way the other side. And he was on the wrong side. Well, his driver was on the wrong side of the road. And his driver had stuff in his pocket, too, that he mm -hmm. shouldn't have. So you know, just leave it alone. Let it go. You pass the test. But then, you know, then there's all the talk about possible retirement. And the only way he's coming out of retirement is if he gets a fight with GSP, a rematch with GSP, or, or the fight with Anderson Silva. I mean, yeah, listen, I'm a major fan of, of Nick Diaz. Always have been. Love his fighting style. I love his attitude. I love everything about Nick Diaz. But enough's enough. Just stop. And you want to talk about a hard sell. Nick, you're coming off back-to-back -back losses. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. You know what I mean? Like you think you're gonna get Anderson Silva? Do, I'm sorry. Do you not like money? I mean, if you, I mean, if you think your money's gonna last forever, that's fine. But it's, I'm gonna tell you right now, it's not. I don't care how much you have. Especially you know, when he's got all that to pay in taxes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. If Mike Tyson can lose 250 million, Nick, you can lose 10. And, and listen, I'll tell you, that was really not a smart thing going with the tax thing and talking about taxes and saying you haven't paid your taxes publicly. Phil, I remember. Phil, not a smart thing. Okay, probably the uh, dumbest. Yeah, thing in the world. yeah. That was like the understatement of the year, right there, buddy. The dumbest thing in the world I, I hey it happened in new york on the howard stern show it happened crazy cabbie this this dj from you know on 92.3 whatever it was he went on stern said he didn't pay taxes an irs agent was listening needless to say cabbie spent a year and a half in jail the irs has like one big case a year they got like, they go into the office on a monday morning they're like oh we got to make an example of somebody hey did you hear that one ufc fighter said he didn't pay his taxes since 2001 go oh cool. close the book yeah. we, got, we got our case for the year it was it was dumbfounding that is the best i mean i think the collective mma world you know together just jaw dropped when he said that it was just like if you saw dana's reaction if you saw my re i mean it was i i I still can't believe it. We're well, still talking about it two weeks later, whatever yeah. long it's been. Like I said, they need to start charging a two-drink minimum for Nick Diaz at press <laughs> conferences. Or just, just dude, go on, the, go on the road. Start doing the nightclubs. I'm telling you, it's, it's funny. It was funny. He was, he was the main event of the press conference. Mm -hmm, <laughs> for sure. Well, let's talk about another UFC fighter with his back up against the wall. He was actually the first guy signed to the UFC on Fox 8 card. That's the UFC returning to Seattle in the Key Arena, July 27th. Melvin Gillard versus Matt Danzig. Yeah, I think this is interesting. This was a fight that was just booked. And Melvin's been going through some, some tough times right now. Um, and w what's interesting is he just left the Black Zillions. And then he said he was going back to Jackson's camp. But Jackson's camp collectively said, no, we don't want you back. So now he's kind of gone to an affiliate of Jackson's camp, which is Grudge Training Center in Denver. Um, I think this, that, you know, that's a, it's a good fit for Melvin. 
But uh, he, he's somebody that right now he, he's got to get his head straight. You know, coming off of, of uh, you know the the knockout to Cerrone, and then um, just he he needs it. He needs to get his head straight. And I'll tell you, Danzig's a tough opponent. And I'll tell you this: you got to wonder with Melvin why. Just why all the moving? Why all the why all the ups and downs? Why all the talk? Why why is this happening? You know he's had problems in the past. It's been it's been a tough road for Melvin, and it doesn't seem to be getting any easier in a point in his career that it probably should be. Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll, we'll have to see. But I like the fight. I like Max Danzig. He's you know I love when they actually have a. Uh, Tough, con- you know, former tough contestants going against each other. You know, it, it brings a little excitement to the fans of the Ultimate Fighter. Like so. season two and season six, yeah. clashing. <laughs> it's awesome. A little bit veterans, and also, you know, what I really like about this move for him, Trevor Whitman. I think Trevor Whitman is the right fit. He's gonna have Pat Barry there. I heard a little bit um, on Twitter yesterday with Pat Barry saying that he was actually kind of involved with talking to Melvin and helping him make this move. So I hope it is the right choice for him. Well, Trevor Whitman's definitely got a good head on his shoulders. He's an excellent coach. Pat Barry, uh, you know, we, we all we all love Pat Barry. Hi, he's, just, he, he's just a fun guy. And, uh, you know, we saw he, him make the move out to Colorado, too, recently. Yep. And, and listen, Melvin's got that raw. I mean, if you look at his record, it is littered with knockouts. And in his knockout percentage, as far as time spent in the UFC and then knockouts, it's I think it's one of the highest that there is. So he's one of those guys that will always have a job in the UFC, presumably. You know what I mean? And and to to have problems or to have all this, the, I don't want to say controversy, but not being able to put it all together at this point in a career is worrisome. Yeah. Um, especially, especially against a guy like Mac, because yeah. Mac is extremely well-rounded. Um, he was a veteran before he even got in the UFC. He fought and pride yeah. before yeah. he was on the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, he was one of those guys you heard rumblings about in King of the Cage and pride, like, yo, when he gets up, when, when he hits the big stage, keep an eye out for him. So... Uh, you know, definitely a dangerous veteran. And if Melvin, you know, you do, he's been up and down like we talked about a lot. And he, I don't, I, I do think he will always have a job, but that doesn't mean, I don't want to say the word retirement, but he's, he's, he's having some trouble. And, it, and like we said, this isn't a time where you should be having trouble. This is a time where you should be building and growing. And it doesn't seem, it seems to be regressing rather than progressing. And he's on, uh, he's one of those few guys that he's a very young guy, but he's got well over 50 fights. Oh, absolutely. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's been in this game for a long time. And, you know, they do say that the shelf life of an MMA fighter is roughly 10 to 12 years, yeah. you know, if, you're, if you stay healthy. So and we know Melvin has had issues with health in the past. Yeah. You know, didn't always take care of himself, and you yeah. know, so we'll have Absolutely. to see. But I, you know, best of luck to him. Well, moving on, guys. Also, UFC 161, the UFC's first trip to the Manitoba province of Canada, Winnipeg. Uh, tickets are on sale this uh, coming week, April 12th. You can visit UFC.com for details on that. But I'm really excited about the fourth women's matchup signed to the UFC. We have Rosie Sexton going against Alexis Davis at Bantamweight, of course. How excited are you guys for this? Uh, I'm down for this fight. I like Alexis Davis. She's an entertaining fighter. She's always fun to watch. And Rosie Sexton, you know, at one time she was considered one of the best in the world. Uh, definitely a cool fight, and I like the fact that they put it on the main card. Uh, you know, you've been seeing, especially with organ. You know, so I think there was some talk with Bellator. A lot of people were giving uh, their owner a lot of grief because he pretty much leaves his women on the undercard. They don't really publicize them. The UFC is going about this the right way, especially since they're trying to build the division. And I was just going to say, let's give credit to that, because prior to the Rousey fight and prior to all this buildup, the questions were, well, what if Rousey loses? Is the division going to be scrapped? And what if what is this? And who are we going to bring in? And all this stuff. Now you've got Misha and Kat fighting at the tough finale. You've got this fight that we're talking about with Alexis and uh, with Rosie. And they're, they're making a real concerted effort, which, which, like you said, you know, is a nice thing to see to, to push this um, – this new endeavor. This is un. Uh, this is un. Uh, kind of traveled ground or whatever. You know what I mean. This is. This there isn't a blueprint for this to 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 bring in a new sex into this male dominated. Um, you know, kind of arena, and the fans are digging it. That's the that's the thing that I'm enjoying is that it is creating real discussion and people are really interested in seeing women fighting, and in sports, especially male dominated ones. I'm. Can you tell me one sport? Where people care about the women. Not, I mean, not even really tennis, or especially not with the WNBA or or Olympic softball, any of that stuff. Yeah. And with Alexis, if you remember her last fight that she had with uh, Shayna Baszler, there was that rear naked choke she put on her. It was a technical submission. It was a really awesome fight. And Rosie Sexton's also bounced back from those days uh, with the Zoila fight where she had that terrible knockout. Brutal knockout. Yeah. So it'll be really good to see how these two come into the UFC built up 
from their last few fights that they've had. And the women always bring it. Let's be honest. Like Ryan said, you know, they're coming in now. They're trying to make a statement. Think about this, you know, when you had women strike force, uh, you know, the, the division, and those girls always stole the show. When you look at some of those fights, because they go out and they, they, they know that people are doubting them. They know that people don't think that they're strong enough. They don't have the knockout power. They're not technically advanced. That's why they have something to prove, and that nothing's more exciting than people that are going out there and trying to prove something. And, and, and I can say, as a, I don't want to say a detractor of women, women's MMA because I've always supported it and I've always loved that they've been behind it, but for me personally, seeing um, – you know, a woman beat up and battered and bruised, it, it always kind of turned me off. Just I'm talking about the strike force fights, Carano, Cyborg, all that stuff, Invicta. But I, I, the point I'm making is with, with the UFC, with the logo, with the cage, with the crowd, with the buildup, the media hype, it, it, it brings another level to it. It, it, it legitimizes it in a way that I, even like I said, as a, as a, as a critic or like someone who was maybe hesitant, just kind of dipping their toes in, you know, I, I was at the at the Rousey fight. That was a main event. Like, that was a main event. When she walked out, the room got hotter. The crowd got crazy, and she delivered. It, it, I don't want to say it changed my mind, but it made me realize that, you know what I mean, just having the UFC brand behind them can do amazing things. So Absolutely. this is a really cool time. I was in that uh, fight over there, and there's one guy running through the crowd with a shirt that said, I love Ronda and Bacon, and you can't go <laughs> wrong with that. When we come back, guys, we're going to have an interview with UFC welterweight Matt Brown on the phone for you. And uh, also we're going to talk a little bit about the UFC on Field TV 9 card. You're listening to MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. The MMA Fight Corner. Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I'm Heidi Fang, and I'm joined today by Ryan McKinnell of MMAWeekly.com and Phil Devine. Guys, we have a very special interview for you today. We uh, spoke with Matt Brown, and he has a fight, of course, coming up with Jordan Mann. That's at UFC on Fox 7, April 20th in San Jose, California, at the HP Pavilion. He was supposed to face Dan Hardy. That's been switched up a little bit. So we had to ask him a little bit about fighting Jordan Mann, and we're going to get to that right now. Joining us now in the MMA Fight Corner, we have UFC welterweight Matt Brown. He was set to face Dan Hardy at UFC on Fox 7, April 20th in San Jose, California. But now he's had an opponent change to Jordan Meehan. Hey, Matt, how are you doing today? Are you there with us?
Meehan versus Hardy? Um, not a whole lot. You know, they're both strikers, both, uh, you know, uh, pretty similar opponents. The, the base thing was just that uh, um, Jordan Mean switches to Southpaw a lot. So I think that's by the base uh, thing we had to bring in, you know, was just some more Southpaw training partners. And did you actually get a chance to see him fight at UFC 58 versus Dan Miller? And what did you think about that fight? Uh, yeah, I watched it on the TV. Um, yeah, he looked pretty good, man. You know, he, I think uh, he's by, I think he's the first person to finish Dan Miller. I think I don't know, but uh, yeah, he looked pretty good. Looked, looked like he was uh, calm and composed for his UFC debut. And, you know, looked like he uh, was patient, did everything he was supposed to do. Yeah, you, you're absolutely right. He is the first person to finish Dan Miller. And the one thing that uh, what I'm really excited about is in the opponent change and you fighting Jordan is you guys are so similar with your stand and bang attitude and the killer instinct. So I'm really looking forward. I think it's a very exciting fight. Yeah, I think it should be a good fight. You know, I think it's, it's going to be exciting. Also, I like uh, the way he fights, and you know, so I think it should match up with my style pretty well. Matt Ryan McKinnell here from MMA Weekly. Uh, I had an initial question. You know, with Dan, you got this veteran who had had all this UFC tape, and you kind of knew what you were getting with Dan. You kind of always brought the same style, brought that exciting style. With Jordan, you know, the flip side of this is he's an up-and-coming, surging fighter. He's a he's a young prospect where, who's a rather unpredictable at times. Was there was there any hesitation being on a four-fight win streak and accepting this fight? You know, given how dangerous Mian presumably is. Uh, no, I mean it's it's my job to fight. You know. I mean, I, I don't really, it's not my job to pick opponents, so I've never turned down a fight uh, in the past, so no reason to start now. Uh, yeah, and, and since the Ultimate Fighter, you know, you've been just one of the those those guys from that season that has really stood out and always had entertaining fights, um, and you've all, we've always seen the talent has been there, and the, you know, the expectations were high, but, you know, you've had your ups and downs. What, what's what been the turning point, that impetus that's been going on with you that has just caused this surge? Man, I've, I've had this question asked me so many times. It, you know, I mean, it's crazy. But, you know, the, the fact is that there wasn't, like, a really one turning point, man. Like, I, you know, things happen in life, you know. And I can make a million excuses for, you know, why I've had losses, whatever. But, you know, it's... It, it, Shit happens, you know. <laughs> Life, you know, takes its turns, and um, you know, I, I wish it, you know that uh, you know it wasn't like that. I wish I could be more consistent, but that's something I've been focusing on, you know. So uh, every day, you know, I just work as hard as I can, and you know, let everything take care of itself. Matt, it seems like you have a you know a good head on your shoulders. Everything you know, you've you've compartmentalized everything really well. But you know, my question is: Is there ever a time? You know, especially during that middle part of your UFC career, it was a lot of ups and downs. Was there ever a time where you, you, you kind of questioned, is the UFC going to cut me? Is my place secure? And now you're riding a four-fight win streak. I mean, as Phil said, the, the tables have turned, but 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 psych uh, uh, mentally, has it always been that way? No, there was definitely, you know, I lost three in a row. I definitely, I, I thought 100% sure I was cut. You right. know, I thought my UFC career was over for the time being, and, uh, you know, I mean, I, there was definitely a point there where I was pretty down on myself, and I was thinking, you know, am I even good enough to be in the UFC? Uh, and I, I, um, I mean, I still think I got a lot to prove. You know, I mean, uh, to myself more than anybody else. And you know, uh, I'm not out there, you know, fighting for the title yet, or in the, you know, talks about being in the top two or three contenders, or whatever. You know, so. You know, and I, I don't have any uh, belt around my waist, so I still got a, a lot to prove, you know, to everyone and, and myself more than anything else. Is there necessarily one thing you could point to that caused that switch, or is it just kind of a kind of a testament to hard work and dedication? Um, I would say may, yeah, mainly, yeah, the testament to hard work and dedication, but um, see, it, it wasn't so much like, like a... Like like a like I switched any, anything for the good as much as getting rid of uh, uh, the negative, you know. I don't know if that makes sense, but you know, there's just a a lot of negative things that happened to me. That, you know, not necessarily things in my control, and the way I responded to them wasn't the right way. And and I think that came 
came through in my fights and my performances. And um, at this point, you know, I've just, I think I've learned to deal with with life a little better. It grew up a little bit, and matured, and uh, and that, that's what it's all about. That's what uh, you know, being a martial artist is about, and that's what uh, life is all about. So, you know, I think I've grown a lot and and learned a lot, and now. You know, something bad can happen to me or something negative it can happen in my life. It's not going to affect me uh, as much as a person or when doing my job. And being a dad will do that, too. You know, you, you're now a father, and I'm sure that's changed, you know, your mentality. And twins, no less. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like you said, twins yeah, is definitely, you know, uh, double the trouble. So, <laughs> you know, the uh, that, I mean, that was like, you know, another one of the things that, you know, I kind of, um, affected me uh, somewhat negatively, you know, at first. You know, I would say you know, um, I looked at it negatively, but, you know, it, it, you know, I, I just had, like, kind of the wrong outlook on it, you know. Like, I was uh, um, constantly fighting with myself about, you know, you know, um, feeling like I had to win for my kids, you know, or I have to do this, I have to do this, and, um you know, putting too, uh, a lot of external pressure on myself. You know, it's just a, another one of the things that, that happened, you know, that, the, you know, I'm talking about here where, where you know, now I've learned, I've grown and I've uh, matured and I've learned how to deal with, you know, being a father and being a fighter and how to balance the two. Yeah, it's, and it's got to be tough, too, you know, when you're away from them when it comes to training camp because you got them on your mind, the, the responsibilities as a dad, but also the responsibilities of, you know, providing for them and, you know, going out and taking care of business. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's like probably the worst part about this job, you know, is, uh, you know, just not being able to spend as much time with my kids as I'd like to. Yeah, and you're away right now. Are you you're, Are you in Colorado, I believe? Yeah. Yeah, so you're training with Mark Beecher in Colorado. Um, what's What's training camp usually like with you? Do you, do you know, I know you go between places. So what's it normally like? Do you spend time in Ohio and then come out to, I know it was Vegas, but now obviously Beecher moved to Colorado. So so what's it normally like? I mean, you know, you got to improvise. You know, it's different every time. You, know, you got to take what you can get. and You know, so it is different every time, but... You know, I, I try to spend as much time as, as I can in, in my hometown, Columbus, Ohio, but, um, you know, the level of training there is just not uh, where it needs to be yet for, you know, where, where I'm at in my career and everything, and the training partners aren't, aren't there yet, but uh, we're building it, and there's a lot of guys coming up that are getting better and better, and I'm hoping within, you know, the next year or two I can stay at home full-time for training camps. Yeah, I think we're going to start seeing that with a lot of fighters, too. You know, the money's starting to come in. It's good. And i I, I got to tell you, it's uh, I'm, I'm happy for you, Matt. I've always been a fan. Loved you on The Ultimate Fighter. You always reminded me of the guy from uh, Days to Confused. Uh, I came here for two reasons, to kick ass and, and two dip. So I'm a big fan, and uh, you know, best of luck to you. Uh, before I let you go, Matt, I do have one more question for you. Did you happen to hear yeah. about the reason Dan Hardy had to back out of the fight? And I'm just curious, um, I guess, what your thoughts or if you got to speak with him about his condition or if you know anything about it. Uh, I mean, I read, you know, just the online stuff about uh, Wolf's heart or something. Right, uh, right. I have no idea what that is. I don't know anything about it. And, yeah, I didn't speak with Hardy. We just, you know, he Twittered me. He was sorry he could... He, he couldn't fight, and, you know, just Twitter back, you know, I still respect her, you know, whatever kind of nice thing I said, you know. Right. That's a pretty crazy thing to happen to a fighter, I mean, to find that out and to have your career ahead of you. And the big fight with you, obviously, I'm sure he's going to be missing out on that, being able to scrap with you. Yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, definitely was a, a big high-profile fight, so that, that's kind of the downside to losing that fight, but, um, uh, you know, or losing the matchup or whatever, you know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, that was a downside, but, you know, it is the life of a fighter, you know? Yep. You just got to uh, get, you know, just keep keep moving forward and keep working hard and let everything work itself out. All right. Well, we appreciate you joining us, Matt. On behalf of Ryan McKinnell, Phil Devine, and myself, Heidi Fang, thank you so much, and best of luck on your fight. All right. Thank you much, sir. Thank you.
Well, guys, I really like what Matt Brown's done here in the last four fights. I mean, he had that one fight with Chris Cope going back to 143. And since then, he's been on a real roll. What do you guys think about him against Jordan Mann? Because, I mean, Mann knocked out Dan Miller. And Miller hadn't been knocked out ever in his career. Neither has Matt Brown. He hasn't you know, have that kind of adversity to face. What do you think about him and Jordan going into this? Well, like you said, Matt's riding a four-fight win streak. And all due respect to Mike Swick, Stephen Thompson, Chris Cope, nobody really compares to how good Jordan Meehan is. I mean, you don't come in in your UFC debut and start a guy like Dan Miller. You just don't do it, especially in the fashion that he did. So for Matt on a four-fight win streak who's had a, a fluctuating UFC career, for him to unequivocally just, you know, give the okay to fight one of these like just new breed surging up and coming fighters is it's a ballsy ballsy move it, it definitely is and he's a ballsy dude you, matt Absolutely. brown's always goes he always goes in there he always brings it always ready to fight um you know i remember doing uh, an interview with him a few years ago when i was in satellite radio and he said uh you know he was like uh listen man I, i'm not the best fighter in the world i'll, I'll admit that i'm not the best in the division but if George St. Pierre showed up at my house right now on my front lawn, I'd fight him because that's he's a fighter. He, and, you know, like you talked about the balls of him to take a fight with Jordan Mean on such short notice or, you know, ha like only a month to prepare for yeah. it. Yep. Um, you know, he talked about the fact that Jordan switches up styles and, you know, he had to bring in some more southpaws. The thing is, is like J Jordan is a beast and. Matt is a beast. So you're going to have these two guys that are going to go in there and they're going to scrap and it's going to be fun. But. Anything can happen. Well, uh, with the prior fight against Hardy, you had a guy who had adequate speed, who had solid power, who had all these things. But with Jordan, it's not just adequate. It's not just the, it's great. It's really, really solid. You know, uh, uh, an entire an entire repertoire that he's bringing into the cage, and he has knockout power. He has finishing ability, which is a testament to like we brought up with the Dan Miller um, that uh, killer finish. instinct. Like, yeah, he just oh goes God. for it. And that, and that's another thing is is he has that. Uh, both of these guys, I should say, for that matter, they do have that killer instinct, and and, and it's that, and and for those that don't really get exact. I mean, yeah, you think, okay, killer instinct. Like, no, what we're exactly talking, kind of uh, uh, really pointing out is like when you have a fighter clipped or when you have a fighter hurt or injured, a lot of guys will take uh, a, a half second or a second pause in between, oh, what should I do next? Should I get in the mount? Should I, should I try to finish it off? Should I go for the submission? Guys like me and guys like Brown, they don't think like that. When they see weakness, they're on it, and they're trying to finish you. That, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no gap. Yeah, no gap whatsoever. It's, it's going to be a fun fight, I'll tell you that. Listen, we, we've had Jordan on the show quite a bit. Jordan's trained here a lot in Las Vegas, you know, d working on his wrestling. That was his one downfall. He's improved on it a ton. It, it's it's going to be a hell of a fight. Uh, you know, every time I see Matt Brown, I just think of those days, you know, the Pete Cell fight where he just beat the yeah. living hell out of him. Yeah, and he's like looking at Eve Levine fight. and he's like, dude, what do I got to do to stop this fight? <laughs> Here's my question. He beats me in five fights in a row. He's won. Is, Matt, is he going to get a title shot? Matt Brown is on the rise. I'm telling you. And I like what he said. You know, like we talked about, we've all, he's always had the talent, all right, but mentally he, it wasn't coming together. And now he's decided, he, he's realized how to put the negative away and think on the positive. Let's it, put him against Carlos Condit and see what happens. Be a fun fight, I'll yeah. tell you that. I mean, if he wins, he's going to get a guy like that. That's what's crazy. A guy that may have, you know, had had these ups and downs in his career who may or may not have been on, out at certain points is now on a four-fight win streak. If he beats me and he's got five, and beating him would give him such a, a, a you know, a strong name to his resume. And, and we could be seeing Matt Brown fight for a title, at the very least a co-main event spot on a numbered pay-per-view, which would be... I don't know. It's, it's amazing. His career arc has been really, really special. Yes. Well, guys, when we come back, we're going to have an interview with UFC lightweight Josh Thompson fighting on the UFC on Fox 7 card and more on the UFC on Fuel TV 9 card. You're listening to MMA Fight Corner on Fox Sports Radio 920 in Las Vegas and worldwide on UFCradio.com. The MMA Fight Corner.
Welcome back to the MMA Fight Corner. I'm Heidi Fang, and today I'm joined by Ryan McKinnell of MMAweekly.com and Filthy Phil Devine, the master of filth himself. <laughs> Guys, uh, we were talking a little bit there about Jordan Meehan and the killer instinct that he has going into this fight against Matt Brown. And, you know, we were getting to talking during the break a little bit about the Ultimate Fighter 17 and the kind of killer instinct that Uriah Hall has. And, you know, Ryan, you weren't here in our last show, so I kind of want to get your take a little bit on your thoughts on that killer instinct and what makes these new breed of fighters so tough well with hall i was i was saying this to my wife when we were watching the show he's arguably the best talent to come out of the ultimate fighter and i'm not talking about i mean we're talking about gray maynard's we're talking about nate diaz's we're talking about forrest griffin's we're talking about a lot of great fighters former champions some that have come through that show um uriah hall is that good you know when he talks he talks with real confidence his eyes don't waver he 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 has really profound things to say, and his self-reflection is amazing. When he talked about um, comparing himself to Anderson Silva, when he said, you know, I think I have that trait where a lot of people look at me like, well, what is he going to do to me in the cage? And he, he, had the, he had this self-realization to break that down, which I would agree with, but it was just such a ballsy statement. And for a young fighter to have that, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, then, and then you look at after the fight um, – when Sonnen looked at him and he said, you know, I've been in that division five years. I'll tell you right now, you're a contender. I was mirroring that, mirroring that statement no more than 30 seconds before that. I looked at my wife and I said, I'll tell you right now, I don't know if he could beat Anderson Silva, but he would give Anderson Silva a run for his money. And I know that's crazy to, to say. I know there's people out there right now that are like, yeah, the greatest fighter of all time is going to, you know, get, get, get tested by an ultimate fighter competitor. That's really just a testament to how good Uriah Hall is. Yeah, and it's really funny. I saw a tweet the other day to Dana White from one of the, some fan he had been watching tough, and he said, Dana, this Uriah Hall guy is a monster. To think that he's lost twice, you need to go out and you need to find these two guys that beat him <laughs> and sign them. Well, and luckily Dana's, they're right Dana's, there. <laughs> Dana's like, uh, yeah, that's done, buddy. We already have them. And, yeah, they're pretty good guys. I'm wondering <laughs> if they're wrestlers. Yeah, yeah and, and mm -hmm. that, that may be the thing. We, you know, we talked to Vinny about it one day. We, you know, Vinny said that, you know, if he faces a wrestler, that's going to be a tough, a tough call. And that's one of the things that I took into account when you're talking about an Anderson Silva. He's not a Weidman. He's not a Munoz. You're not. You're, there's really very little chance that you get wrestled or taken to the ground. So, in essential, an Anderson Silva or I Hall matchup would be nothing but stand up. Absolutely. And and a nothing but stand up match. You go ahead. I mean, listen, Anderson Silva is the greatest fighter of all time. I don't care what you say. No I doubt. There's there's really no way you can debate that. Um, but the fact that, that that Uriah Hall is that dangerous, and, and we were talking about killers earlier. I mean, I, I got, a lot, I got a, lot, not a lot of nice rhetoric to say and a lot of nice things to say about Alder's killer. And listen, Uriah Hall almost rewrites the book on that. <laughs> yeah. Like he said the other day, and you told him, when he's just like looking in the camera and he says, all I need is that, that split second. second. Yep. That split second for him to leave an opening and I'm going to take it. And, and what and did he do? Yep. Eight seconds into the fight, he saw the opening and took it. Knee to the sternum, hook over the top. It was like a video game combo. <laughs> it, was like, it was like square, square, triangle, X, and it just flowed so well. And that's the thing with Uriah Hall. He flows so well. He acknowledges that he's scared. That's one of the most important things that you have to do as a fighter. If you're going out there all hard and like, oh, I'm just going to run through ball, you know, you, you can't touch me and whatever, you're lying to yourself. The important, you know, fighting is so mental. You've got to be honest with yourself. You have got to be, uh, 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 you know, uh, contrite with all the things that are happening in your life and, and 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 when you step in the cage what that means for you in a, in a life path sort of way and, and also and he's you know another thing about Uriah is he's always very gracious towards his opponents even the ones that you know he doesn't think are that dangerous he still explains that it's a fight you know and, and it usually takes fighters a long time to get to, to get to the kind of the, the psyche that Uriah Hall has developed. Well, and he has this in the ultimate fighter. Well after the those two devastating yeah. knockouts you're kind of like you look at the guy and you're like, damn, he's got knockout power, and but you you worry about the opponent. You yeah. do. Like I, I'll be honest, I said it the other day. I didn't love Bubba McDaniel's on the show. He kind of rubbed me the wrong way watching it. And you know, I'm making a joke beforehand. I hope I I hope he gets knocked out. And then when he does, you're like, I hope he's okay. I was mm -hmm. I was talking to a former tough competitor who's all, uh, who's fighting up uh, uh, at the tough finale, Sam Cecilia. Some of you know him, and he said, uh, you know, Uriah Hall is just that kind of guy that nobody wants to fight. It's just, I mean, it, it, it's true. 
It's true. When you already have that, and you're, uh, I don't want to say he's an amateur because he's not. Obviously, he's fought Weidman and Costas. He's fought great people, and he's and he's had a a, a, a tenured career up until now. But boy, you know what I mean? Like to to see this the way it's happening and the way I mean, Tough was dead. You know what I mean? There was not a lot of of hype in the, in terms of it was a lot of what are they gonna do? How are they gonna change the product? You know, how are they gonna make this viable again? And then. Through no production, I mean, yes, they changed the production. They did all that stuff. That's fine and dandy. We love it. Everyone loves it. But on top of all that, they've got this gem in Uriah Hall mm -hmm. that's leading all this discussion and kind of, you know, it's really cool. We don't and even know if he wins and we're talking right, about Right, right, right. No, that's true. I mean, he could lose. This could, he could, but come on. What? Is, on he's not going to lose. <laughs> Sorry, right. Yeah. Moving on here to the uh, UFC on Fuel TV 9 card this Saturday at the Ericsson Globe Arena in Stockholm, Sweden. We actually have a couple more tough alumnus on that card. We have Akira Korsani coming into a fight versus Rob Robbie Peralta on the main card. So let's get into a little bit of this main card. That starts actually at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific on Fuel. Akira was a tough uh, semifinalist for the 14th season of The Ultimate Fighter, but he couldn't fight or make his debut in that finale. And he just took a split decision win home over Andy Ogle, but there was a lot of controversy over that fight as to whether or not he actually won or if Ogle was robbed. And then, of course, you have Problems Peralta. He's on a nine-fight win streak. Except, wait, I'm sorry, for that accidental headbutt that happened against uh, Mackin Sesimer. But other than that, I mean, if you take all his wins together, this guy is writing nine fights in a row. Yeah, Peralta's a beast. Uh, I, I agree with you. The, 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 the uh, Akira fight with Andy Ogle was a little controversial. I particularly, I thought Ogle won the fight. You know, judges didn't see that way. Uh, you know, Akira's a, a good fighter. When you saw him in The Ultimate Fighter, he, throw, he throws some nice combinations with his punches. Doesn't have crazy knockout power. He's a Henzo Gracie fighter. He's got good submissions, but Peralta's a beast, dude. And Peralta has that knockout. Yeah, power. Peralta has the knockout power. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's gonna be. A, it's an entertaining fight. Uh, you know, and it's one of those Sweden against uh, you know the world fights, basically. And uh, you know, we've talked about it before. The Brazil factor. Will it be in effect in Sweden? I don't know, uh, but it's, I think it's going to be a, a good fight to start off and it'll get the crowd pumped. And moving on again, we have another Ultimate Fighter se uh, Season 14 winner in Diego Brandao. I love this kid. I love what he brings into the cage, his energy, his speed, his prowess. Like he's developing. We see more and more out of him each time he gets in there. And this time he's going to tussle against Pablo Garza. Uh, you know, he's had a couple losses in a row to Poirier and Bermudez, but uh, you know, he did rebound against uh, Hominick at UFC 154. So, well, you, you're talking about it, the losses. I mean, the, the two names that you just met, oh, they're beasts. Yeah, they're beasts. <laughs> Gar Garza yeah. is a very tough dude, but Brandau. I mean, Diego Brandau, when he won the Ultimate Fighter with the, uh, he beat Dennis Bermudez with that slick armbar submission. Mm -hmm. His transitions are beautiful. He has the power. You know, we talked about. Uriah Hall earlier about what a beast he was. No one wanted to fight Diego Brandao on that season of The Ultimate Fighter because of his knockout power and some of the stuff that he was doing. Trains with Jackson. He's got a good camp behind him. Um, but, um, sorry, Garza, very tall featherweight. Very tall. He's 6'1". Tall, lanky, very you know, uh, uh, unpredictable. He's a veteran. Good chin. He's never been knocked out. Great chin. And, and here's the thing with Brandau. I like the guy. He seems like a nice kid. Trains out of a great camp. My concerns with Brandau, wrestling, as Elkin showed, and conditioning. Now, with Garza, you've got a guy, yeah, he may not out-wrestle you, but he's going to make the fight uncomfortable. And there's a solid chance that gets dragged into the third round. Oh, absolutely, and, and that's that, where and that's where I see Pablo being able to take control. Because Diego comes out like a ball of absolutely. fire every time. He's it's aggression, balls to the walls, right in your face to start every fight. If Pablo, if Garza can withstand that barrage and take this fight into deep waters, we had talked about it uh, the other show about Marcus Brimage and Conor McGregor. McGregor's never seen the third round. Nope. So Brimage is you know a, a good strike is to try to. Uh, withstand that early barrage and drag him into deep waters. I, I agree that the way for Pablo Garza to win this fight is to drag him into deep waters. All right, moving on to one of my favorite fights on the card. I uh, really, really can't just, I'm looking so much forward to this. We have the number five ranked Brad Pickett versus 
number nine ranked Mike Easton, the Hulk. Uh, of course, both of them are coming off losses. However, this fight, I don't think it goes all three rounds just because of the way these two come in to finish. But if it did, I'd be very excited about it. Pickett's only actual one-punch knockout in homage to his nickname was against Eve Jabwe. And Dana's a huge fan of this guy. He makes it well known that he loves him. Uh, he has wins over Menjavar and uh, Demetrius. And Easton's coming in with, a, he'll go in and fight with his limbs falling off. We, we talked to him in that one interview. Grimy. Yeah. <laughs> he was talking about all the grime and he, how he was in there. And he was in, I think, with his arm broken. And they had to call the fight, right? Th that's yeah. one, the, the one loss on his career before right. losing to his son, Sal, was a broken arm. He had a broken arm, couldn't continue in the fight. Uh, but this is, you're correct, a very exciting fight. It could it could be fight of the night. I don't know. Brad Pickett, um, it's always fun, entertaining to watch. He, he hung in there with Barrow until he got caught with a s submission. Easton, you know, never been knocked out. Going against a guy with knockout power. It, it's a fun fight, dude. I don't see this fight ending. I don't. I know that might not be a popular. I just see so much energy in both these guys and so much, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, a lack of quit. <laughs> they just, I mean, they, they, they go so hard. Um, I remember seeing Mike Easton for the first time before I really knew who he was at the last WEC event in Phoenix, which was the Pettis-Henderson cage kick. Mm -hmm. Dominic Cruz fought on that fight before that. Literally for 15 minutes, we're, we're in the media hallway, and I'm hearing this screaming coming from outside the hall. You can do this. You're the man. Ain't nobody taking this. This is your time. And, and I get out there, and there's this little guy screaming in Dominic Cruz's face and I'm literally talking for like 15 minutes like he's turning purple he's just screaming in his face and he's hyping like, I didn't know he was a UFC fighter and I remember looking at Danny Acosta of MMA Junkie and all that good stuff and I said to him and I and I, and I was I was like man if that guy fought in the UFC he'd be dangerous yeah Easton's a dangerous <laughs> dude brings a know, lot of energy brings a lot of energy pick it you know fun fun guy to watch fight I, I, I agree with you, Ryan. I don't see this one finishing. I see it going to the distance, and I see it being a very tough fight to call. And Pickett's one of those guys where he's a lot of people's favorite fighter at that weight. He's been around a long time, so I'm, I'm in agreement with both of you. I'm really looking forward to and, this fight. And we're calling him One Punch. That's his nickname. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Everyone says, you know, thought it was from Snatch with <laughs> One Punch. But it's actually based off his grandfather. Okay, his grandfather was a boxer. Bare knuckles, right? Okay, bare knuckle boxer. Yeah. The thing is, is like... He's known as One Punch, but the dude's got like 10 submission wins. <laughs> He's got submissions. So this is a fight that can take place anywhere, and I think it will. It'll take place everywhere. Yep. It may not even be contained to the octagon. So it's just going to be a fun scrap. I'm looking forward to it. I see it going to the distance, and I see it being a tough fight to call. Well, guys, when we come back, we're going to get to break down the rest of this card here for you. You are listening to MMA Fight Corner at the Fox Sports 920 Studios in Las Vegas and live on UFCWorldwide.com. Use the MMA Fight Corner.
with Ryan McKinnell and Phil Devine. As promised, we do have an interview here coming up with UFC lightweight Josh Thompson. He's fighting on the UFC on Fox 7 card in San Jose, April 20th, and going to brawl against Nate Diaz. Josh, how are you doing today? Doing good. How's everything going? Excellent. Thank you so much for the time. We very much appreciate it. So, of course, you were in strike force for quite some time. You had all those wars against Gilbert Melendez, and now you're going up against a very close training partner of his, Nate Diaz. How psyched are you for this fight? Uh, I think it's a good. I think it's a good fight to come into the UFC with. I think um, <clears throat> everyone knows who Nate is, given that he just fought Benson for the title. Um, everyone knows who I am in Strike Force because I just fought Gil, Gil and I have fought three epic battles in Strike Force, and um, you know all three times for the title. So everyone knows who I am in Strike Force, and so it's just. Uh, yeah, I think it's kind of a. <clears throat> it's a perfect matchup. Both both of us are coming off of uh, title losses, and um, I guess kind of getting ready to work our way back up to a title shot in the UFC. And do you feel like because you fought Melendez that you have a lot of familiarity with, with Nate going into this and their camp and how they come in prepared for fights? No, I mean, uh, stylistically, they're, they're similar as far as, like, the boxing and stuff, but I think that Gil is a little bit harder. Nate is, throws punches and combinations more, and, and um, you know, and I think that Nate's better on the ground. So I think stylistically, I think Nate is a little bit bigger of a threat for me uh, than Gil is. You're, you're a veteran in the sport, Josh, and, you know, I know that they said some people say ring rust isn't an issue, but it's been a while since you've been in there. Uh, do, does that it all in the back of your head? Yeah, I think people who say ring rust is an issue is uh, really I've never fought. So I think um, it's it, it definitely is an issue, and, you know, if, even if you are trying to train and even if you are staying up with your training, there's nothing like getting in there and fighting at a pace, um, like a real fight. I mean, you can try and spar and do all those things <clears throat> on a daily basis, but you'll never push yourself as hard as you will in the real fight. So the ring rust is definitely something that, that plays a, a factor. Uh, I really couldn't tell you if it's going to be that big of a factor, um, you know, until I get in there. And it being the, my first fight back in the UFC, it'll be, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how I feel when it comes to uh, showing up to the venue. You know, Josh, you had said that everyone knows you from Strike Force, but as you just brought up, that, you know, you are a UFC veteran. And in fact, that uh, on the UFC highlight video or reel that plays before every major pay per view, um, you know, the, there's there's that uh, the highlight reel that's on there uh, of your past fight with your knockout. Um, yeah. I just want to get your your uh, your thoughts on being back in the UFC after all this time, after toiling in other promotions, and now you're finally back home, man. Well, I think, you know, like I said, I started my career there in the UFC, and uh, it's going to be it's kind of nice to kind of come home and basically finish my career there. You know, I'm, I'm hoping that my career ends here, and it should, uh, you know, give, if given my my experience, just my, you know, just the ability. I think I think the well-roundedness that I have <clears throat> as far as being a fighter, I feel, that, I feel that I'll probably end up finishing my career here. You know, so it, it's kind of nice. It's nice to be home. It's nice to, to be back here. I mean, like, I was fighting the UFC before. It was cool. So it kind of lets me feel, it makes me feel good about that. I, I love that statement. I was fighting right. in the UFC before. It was cool. <laughs> so yeah. this fight yeah. for True, you. True, too. Yeah, this fight for you is pretty awesome because it's right in your own backyard at the HP Pavilion. I mean, you could basically walk there, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I'm from San Jose, and I think AKA is uh, somewhere downtown. Am I right? Yeah. No, AKA is down off of Bernal. It's just oh, okay. Bernal a little bit, yeah. yeah but it is, it is, it is still, I mean, close enough for me to walk. A lot closer than Stockton. <laughs> no, no doubt. So, um, with that hype behind you, I mean, uh, who is going to be cornering you for you uh, for you for this fight? Who are you going to be working with in training? Uh, you know, I've been working with the guys over at AKA, and, and um, you know, I have a, a new kickboxing instructor, Derek Ewan, and I also have. Um, Bob Cook, who will be cornering me as well, and then I've got I've been working with uh, Rick Noble, who's a boxing coach uh, who trains Karina Moreno, who is also a four-time world champion uh, and boxer, and then um, of course I've been working with Leandro Vieira, who is uh, a BJJ black belt, uh, with him and his uh, two brothers. Are they? Are you guys still filming anything over at AKA? Do you, like, cause I yeah. love I love that thing you guys did that on um, I forgot the name of the show that you did, but it was amazing. Oh, Fight Factory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys yeah. doing anything like that again? We're Right now, from what I understand, they're trying to they, basically they're they're talking about doing a second season, but we haven't started filming anything on that. Uh, I really wanted to start. I, I think a lot of the guys were kind of hoping we'd get picked up for a second season. I do know there was some interest, um, you know, from one of the networks. I don't really know anything else beyond that, though, to be honest. Well, I mean, I'd be. But there's filming every day here. <laughs> there's <laughs> filming every day, whether it's that show or 
or any, I mean, like right now they're doing commercials on Kane. Uh, you know, they've done a, a bunch of, actually just last yesterday we had ESPN in there for, uh, for my, myself in DC. And so um, it's just been, it's been like a nonstop zoo given all the big fights coming up. Well, when you got a camp of killers like that, that's usually what's going to happen. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned the Gilbert Melendez fight, and uh, honestly, uh, I, I think you won the last one. Uh, you know, I know a lot of people that are flip-flopping on it. But you guys have fought three times, and each time you've fought, it's been 25, or, or 25 minutes of amazement, you know, or, or, you know, even three rounds or whatever. It's always fun. Do you want to fight him again, or will we ever see a Gilbert Melendez, Josh Thompson for? I mean, honestly, I feel that it. I feel like it'd be stupid for the UFC not to have us fight at least one time in the UFC, and um, especially for the title. I think it'd be. I think it'd just be surreal to have, uh, given the fact the last fight was so controversial, and if he wins this fight and I win this fight, I think it would just be the next step, you know, for the two of us to fight for each other, you know, fight fight against each other for the UFC title. You know, um, given, just like I said, just given that the last fight was so controversial. I mean, I've, I still to this day, to this day, you probably had say close to three or four tweets or Facebook messages or whatever just saying how uh, I feel like people thought I got robbed. People commenting to him, you know, basically like, you know, uh, what's it called, tagging him on the stuff. And I feel kind of bad because it's kind of disrespectful, you know. But um, you know, people are entitled to their opinion, and uh, you know, I feel like um, I feel like the opportunity, if it presents itself, of course. I mean, like I said before, um, I really, it's not it's not really up to me who I fight. If UFC says, hey, we want you to fight this guy, and if he's next to mine, he's next to mine. You know, what I mean, I think when you hit the level that we're at, you really shouldn't be turning fights down. Nice. Well, look, we, I hope it happens. So do I. As a fan, I can't wait for that, man. But we surely appreciate the time here, Josh, and thank you so much for joining us. We wish you all the best against Nate Diaz at UFC on Fox 7. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Thanks. Yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Love Fight Month. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Speaking of fight month, let's get back to the UFC on Fuel TV 9 card. We have a few minutes here to wrap it up. Let's talk about Matt Meathead Mitrion facing Phil DeFreeze. They were, they were supposed to fight at UFC 155, but then Mitrion got pulled against uh, pu- against Roy Nelson. And then DeFreeze actually got that knockout loss to Todd Duffy. What do you guys think about this fight? I think if Meathead can, as uh, they call him now, you know, <laughs> the one thing he's got going against him right now, and I think that's the – the fact that with the Black Zillion camp and every all of the negative things coming out of there, he trains with the Black Zillions, but he's tough as nails, former pro football player. And just think, all of his pro fights have been in the UFC. I think he's got, coming off a two-fight uh, you know, two losing streak, knocked yeah. out for the first time. Congo I think, I, I think right. this is a good fight for him. I see him. He puts his hands on DeFreeze. DeFreeze going to sleep. And they've got their backs against the wall, man. Both this of is, them. This is one of, yeah, this is one of those fights that... You know, both of them need to win. So I'm interested to see how that plays out in the cage and how they fight. Phil especially. I think he's lost three out of his last five, yeah. man. So, okay, moving on to the co-main event, Ross Pearson versus Ryan Couture. This is a huge, big test for Couture going in against Pearson, who is looking really, really uh, sharp at 155. Yeah, you know, he dropped to 145, and you can see that the weight cut didn't really agree with him. This is a tough fight for Ryan Couture. You know, he's not getting any favors on his first UFC fight, uh, but... He has stepped up to the plate on numerous occasions. He's fought guys and beat guys that he wasn't supposed to. I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again. Yeah, but this isn't Connor Hewn. This isn't KJ Noons. You know, this is Ross Pearson. It is. And, and you talk about getting thrown to the deep waters right off the bat. You are absolutely correct. I don't like this fight for Ryan, but if you were to be able to pull it off, Got another couture in the UFC. Absolutely. <laughs> and what concerns me, though, is that he is going in there without two of his regular corners. No pops there right. and no kneel. So right. we'll see how that tests, uh, how he fares through that adversary, adversity. Uh, next we have, of course, the main event, Gegard Musasi versus Elir Latifi. I mean, this fight could be crazy. Like you said, he struggles against wrestlers, Musasi. And what do we have? A purebred wrestler. You know, we're watching the weigh-ins earlier, and, and every single fighter made weight, which was great to see. But Musasi came up there with that, what he is. He's cool, calm, collective. Nothing phases him. He's trained with Fedor in the past. He was part of that Red Devil team. So I think he's got the same mentality. You'd never know if he's in a fight. 
But stylistically, very tough fight for him. And that's the thing. He was training for a stand-up wizard in Alexander Gustafsson, and now he's facing a guy that we don't have a lot of tape on. We don't necessarily know what he's going to bring to the cage. We do know that he's got a solid wrestling credentials for being international. I think he was a national team member. He's got, he's got He's got submission backgrounds. Listen, I'm, I'm not saying Gagard shouldn't be the favorite, but the MMA world might not want to be up in arms if Latifi were to somehow go in there and, and, you know, control that fight and make a huge upset, you know, out of a out of a main event that just kind of came out of nowhere. I mean, I think people are kind of left in the MMA world like, Latifi? No no <laughs> training camp, but he's going to go right. with the nose. Hold on. We, we ran over. It stopped, uh, it stopped recording. Hold on a second. Let me bring this back up here. So, all right. I was trying to get you guys through here. Um, yeah, sorry. That's okay. We are about 30 seconds behind. Yeah. I don't know exactly when you guys left off here, so uh, do you want me just to start? It's all right. It's all right. We can just do that, just just like that. All right. Well, you guys are live here, so just you know, just tell me what you want to do. Coming back through here, wrap it up. You you were you were finishing. You were right in the middle of something. If you can pick up your thought, I'll pick it up in there. Um, Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What you said, and then and then there was the the no training camp. No training camp. He's gonna go what he knows, and that's the wrestling. Yeah, and and like we talked about, you know. Gustafson, you know, was set to have to set to face off in this main event. He's a stand-up wizard, you know what I mean. And and when you're when you're preparing for something like that, especially uh, another stand-up fighter in like Gigard, um, you know, Latifi could throw a real monkey wrench in this. I, uh, you know, don't be too don't be too surprised if he were to pull off a shocking upset. Well, guys, we are all out of time for today. Just don't forget tomorrow morning, wake up early for that UFC on Fuel TV nine card. The Facebook fight start at seven forty-five a.m. Pacific and ten forty-five Eastern. Thank you for joining us on the MMA Fight Corner. On behalf of Phil Devine and Ryan McKinnell, and I'm Heidi Fang. Thanks for listening. The MMA Fight Corner.